Scripture reading today is in Hebrews 12, 14 through 16. <clears throat> Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter roots grow up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral, immoral or in godliness like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son, so bit. Take it out of my pocket. Okay, I probably knocked it on the floor now, but it's, we'll try it. Okay, bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for the opportunity that we have in this country to come and freely worship you, Lord. We also pray for those that are persecuted for praising and calling your name. Lord, we thank you that you are working out a great and mighty salvation. Lord, help us to not take it for granted, but to fix our eyes on Jesus, to encourage one another, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you, to realize that we are in this race that you have set out before us and that we are running it together with one another. Help us to run it well through the power of your Spirit. Lord, help us to have compassion and love as Jesus had, that he was willing to lay down his life to save us that before him was the cross and he sought it with joy because of the salvation that you are working out. We thank you for being such a mighty, awesome God. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, Father. And we just thank you and praise you. Open our eyes, open our ears to hear your words, impress them upon our hearts, and let the Spirit guide us and lead us to all truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitle this, What the Spectators See. You know, every race has spectators, doesn't it? Sometimes there are racers out in the crowd. Sometimes there are just other people out in the crowd. But there are people watching you run your race. Get it? And God knows your heart. He knows if you're in the race, you're really in the race, or you're just going through the motions. But a lot of times people can figure that out too. Because you're either living like Christ, that's what the word means, Christian, little Christ, like Christ, or you're not. And man, mm, Jesus gave up heaven, was born of the creation that he created, had to listen to his mom and dad when he had the words of life. He grew up with not a lot. He had to, be, he had to flee to Egypt to, to escape death. And then when he started his public ministry, he had 12 guys that he called closest to him. One of them betrayed him, and the other 12, boy, he had to keep just saying, listen up, guys, listen up. And then when he went to the garden, knowing what was in front of him, he literally sweat drops of blood. He was in such turmoil because what he had to go through, what was coming up. But before that joy set before him, he went. He said, Father... He said, if you can take this cup from me, take it from me because it's going to be so painful. Not just the physical, but the spiritual. God ripping God apart from himself to save mankind. Wow. So how do we live like Jesus? We have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who wrote it and who makes it and establishes it firm. But we also have to remember Jesus' words that it is better for Him to leave this earth so that the Holy Spirit can come. And the Holy Spirit will not only sanctify us through and through, but will continue to sanctify us through and through. It's our seal that we know we are His. 
The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. So it is actually Jesus living His life through us to be more and more like Christ. So that means I have to take the I out of the equation of sin and replace it with the O, with the Son, every single minute of every single day. I can't do it. The Old Testament is proof of all that. There is no way that I can live a holy life. So I have to continually pray and seek the power of the Spirit, die to myself, my fleshful desires, so that I walk in step with the Spirit, so that I can not only walk but run this race, and that we can run it together, strengthening each other, comforting each other, whatever it takes to run this race well. Because guess what? People watch us. Do you understand that? I mean, one reason, I'll say it to myself so I'm not pointing fingers this way, that there's not as many of our children in here is because they've seen my hypocrisy. When many times I didn't have enough time because I was tied up into this, or I said, well, this will be okay, and I cut my values or whatever they are, and I don't write the words of life on the doorposts of my house. I don't talk about them when I go to bed, when I get up, when I'm eating a meal. Because there are other things that compete with my love for the Lord. But Scripture's clear to love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Because that's what the people will see. You can be as devout a religious person as, as there ever was, but if you don't love others, it's nothing but hypocrisy. It's nothing but a lie. I'm trying. It's coming from here now. You want me to lose it or keep it? Or just turn me down a hair? Okay. If you want me to lose it later, just say lose it, because I can talk loud enough, especially if I get excited about Jesus. We started this letter in Hebrews, and I talked about Jesus is better than anything. That's what the author said, and he is better and better and better the way the author of Hebrews portrays it. And he should be getting bigger and bigger. He's the biggest thing there is. He should be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in your life so that you're firmly grounded, so that you don't drift away. Because many people are drifting away in the Hebrew church because of false teachings and because of persecutions. And then we read the letters to, Thess to the church in Thessalonians, the church to the letters in Galatia, and you should be starting in your letters to the church at Corinth. And the church in Thessalonia ha had false doctrines that was in there, and they were even worried about they had missed Jesus' second coming. And the Galatians, Paul says, Oh, you foolish Galatians, how are you so quickly turning from the truth? And now we get to this church in Corinth, which looks more like the church in the United States than any church I know a letter for. Because it's a church that's tied up in the ways of the world instead of the ways of Jesus. And they think they're fine. If you remember from reading that already, they, Paul says, you think you're rich and that you've already begun to reign. But we apostles are on parade. We've given up our lives we think we're rich because we live in the United States when there are Christians around the world still suffering for the name of Jesus. Guess what, though? We are rich. So like the rich man who, who got up and his, his, his farms were full of grain, what did he say? He said, I'll build bigger barns. When, when God required his life that day, and Jesus said, you fool. Sometimes the reason that we have so much is because we can give so much to others. But we can't if we're tied up in the things of the world and we're seeking after them. That's why I said and pointed with my fingers at myself. I know my son and I know other people have seen my hypocrisy. Father, forgive me for that. Guide me by your Spirit into all truth, to be like Jesus, where nothing matters but Jesus, where I fix my eyes on Him. I don't get distracted. I don't let anything entangle me, and I get rid of those sins. Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's our scripture there. In 1 Corinthians, the believers were still tied up in the ways of the world. They brought in pagan rituals. There was divisions. There was pride. There was boasting. There was worldly wisdom. There was lack of growth and maturity. 
There was, the Spirit was there because Paul says, starting out, that, that you've, you've been given every spiritual gift there, there possibly is. But they fought over them to see who was better than others because I have this gift and you only have this gift. This is a church that he's writing this letter to. And this is not the first letter that he's written to them because he's heard these quarrels and everything. They're even arguing over who's a better teacher or a guide, who they're following and everything. They're so distracted, how can they ever be like Christ? I mean, at least the churches in, in Galatia and the church in Thessalonica, they were being persecuted and there were some false doctrines coming in, but this church is just like, hey, anything's fine. Prosperity gospel, if you want to believe it. This, if you want to believe that, it's all fine. Kumbaya. Sorry. I'm going to say it again, whether you agree with me or don't agree with me, it, it looks a lot like the church in the United States. Everything's okay, love Jesus. But Jesus said that you will obey His commandments if you're His children. And God is a holy God, and without holiness no one will see the Lord. Now guess what? That's not by your own merit. Again, it's by faith. It's by Jesus' finished works. It's by Jesus working through you that you are righteous. But if you're not living righteous at all, then you better step back and examine yourself and see if the Spirit really is in you or not, or you're just playing games. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty miracles in your name? But Jesus will say, depart from me, I don't know you. That's people that are involved in the church that look like even they're like Christ, but their motives are all wrong. They're doing it for their own gain or for whatever reason it is. Be careful that your works aren't burned up. Paul writes that. And be careful that you escape the flames. Don't be foolish. Shed off the things that cause you from running well. Paul even goes to the point where he says in the chapters we read already, maybe I should bring a rod of discipline to do some whooping. This is the church he's writing a letter to. There's adultery going on in the church, and people are boasting about it. And he tells them that the yeast of this will go a long way, and I'm sitting here as I'm reading this thinking about all the words of Jesus, and don't be afraid to go back and read those. The yeast that we should have should not be our hypocrisy, as Jesus warns about, but our love for one another, the compassion that we have. Yes, we have freedom in Christ, but that means we have freedom to become a servant or a slave to all, as Jesus said. Doing what is right and godly and loving others over ourselves, thinking of the needs of others more than we think of the needs of ourselves. And if you made it through where you're supposed to be, you made it to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And you see this part about sexual sin. And the first thing we think of is, ah, I'm not a part of that. I don't do those kind of things. Those people do those kind of things. And don't say you don't do it. <laughs> but see, if you're still dealing with any kind of idols or even these snares in your life, then it's like you're committing adultery with God. He gave His one and only Son to save you so that you'd be in a relationship with Him. If I even look at another woman lustfully, don't you think my wife is offended and hurt? I don't want that for her. And I certainly don't want that God feeling that way. And I certainly don't want to grieve the Spirit that seals me the Spirit that will transform me through and through and guide me into all truth. This church is way off course. And the sad thing is, as you read 2 Corinthians, as you get into that, is you don't see much of a course correction. They live in a world that is worldly. They're not being persecuted. So the world invades them to where sports are more important, where Sundays is my day of play, not my day of worship, where I've got a job I've got to do and people responsible for, but I don't have time to go see my neighbor who's in need and hurting, where I have a strange relationship with my family and friends, but that's okay, I don't have time for that nonsense. I'm living my life right and reading my Bible. Is it soaking in? 
Are you hearing the words of life and are you obeying? Is the Spirit transforming you through and through? As you read this letter, do a self-evaluation. I hope and pray we're not like this church at all, but I see so many ways that I am like that, so I know that my brothers and sisters are, and I pray that God will take away anything that snares me and the sin that so easily entangles and guide me with His Spirit so that I can help guide you. And I need you too. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, Flee or run. We're running that race. From sexual immorality, all other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you, know that, do you not know that your bodies, plural, just like we're plurally running this race in Hebrews, are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, you, plural, all of us, are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. But it's hard to honor God with your bodies when your mind is somewhere else and your heart's focused on somewhere else. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength and body. Give it everything that you have to run this race. Don't do it halfway. When you're tired and you've got to get pushed along, Hopefully someone's there to help push you along. And if they're not, let Jesus Himself through the Holy Spirit push you along. Because you'll walk through that valley of the shadow of death. Jesus' grace is sufficient for you. And the light at the end of the tunnel is the fact that Jesus has finished it for you, the author and perfecter of your race, so that you run that race well and you inherit your inheritance, that you're not like Esau. 1 Corinthians 6 also said, why not rather be wronged? Well, that's a principle that a lot of Christians don't understand. Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Well, here's a good example. I can say verse 8, that's 1 Corinthians 6, 8. I don't cheat and do wrong. But if I back right up, why not rather be wronged? I struggle with that one. <laughs> I might not cheat you, but I sure don't want to be cheated. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I'm going back to Jesus' again. I don't want to love just my enemies. As we read through the Psalms, you see it all the time where David is talking about his enemies. And Lord, come down and take care of this problem. But then he turns from that and says, Lord, I delight in you and I comfort in you and I find peace in you. You are my rock, my refuge, my strength. And David didn't know the name Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, well, let me finish in 1 Corinthians 6 first. Verse 9 says, Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, of course I know this. <laughs> do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, which is covetousness, nor drunkards, nor slanders, those are the ones that cause mischief, mischief, busybodies, gossipers. I don't think we have them in the church. Nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Again, it's so easy to read these things, and, and you probably did when you heard one of them. Oh, yeah, I'm not that guy. Forgive me if I thought that way, Lord. Okay, forgive me for thinking that way. How's that? Is that better? Because I am a sinner saved by grace. I deserve God's grace no more than anyone else an axe murderer. Grace comes by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, because God is the one who is gracious. He can forgive any sin. And it is His will that all mankind come to Him. So that swindler, that's the last one in that list. I'm not a swindler. A swindler is one that is ravenous, ferocious. One who feeds his own appetite. Well, wait a minute. Now maybe I got some of that swindler in me. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Jesus said, Watch out. You got a warning here, just like you did in 1 Corinthians 6, about do not be deceived. Matthew 7, verse 15, Watch out for false prophets. This is talking about people in the church. They come to, to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves, swindlers. 
By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes, grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Sobering verses to get you to do a reality check to see where you stand with Jesus Christ. What is the fruit that's being produced in your life? How is the race that you are running? And are you running it with one another? Are you there for one another? If again you're having a strange relationships with your family and stuff because you can't get along, how are you going to get along with the church? How are you going to get along with your enemies? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11. And that is what some of you were. You're not that anymore whatsoever. Instead, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. There is the cross that Jesus went to. And if you believe in Him, then you've enlisted to follow after Him and you're running a race, the one that's set out before you individually and collectively as a body. And you've got to run well. We've got all these examples from Hebrews chapter 11 and now we're in Hebrews chapter 12 and we see a adulterous, godless example in Esau. He wasn't that bad, was he? Uh, well, well, let's examine him and see what, what his sin was. His sin was that he did not care about his birthright. Don't miss this. Who he was. Do you know the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and then to Jacob? Because God foreknew that Esau wouldn't care about it, that the world mattered more. So Esau did not inherit that blessing. Esau is the one who should have been named in that line, in that lineage. But he was not because he did not consider it something worth having. Are you working out this great salvation that you've been given? Does it mean everything to you? And are you joyfully telling others about it? Paul had wrote to the Corinthian church in verse, chapter 3, verse 3, You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? I can say I don't see much of that in this church, and I'm so thankful. But I see a lot of that in a lot of churches. And that's the reason you hear a lot, and we laugh about it, that churches were divided when they started talking about something over the color of the carpet in the nursery. These are true cases. Because we get so far, and we need to re do a reality check and know who we are in Christ and how we should act and love and live, and we can't do it on our own because I cannot love my enemy on my own. I can't love my wife or my son on my own. But I can love even my enemy, and that'll help in my other relationships that I just mentioned, by knowing that Christ first loved me. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, Paul said, here's the difference in him and the church of Corinthians, but we have the mind of Christ. Do you have the mindset of Christ? And in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 5, he said, For in Him you have been enriched in every way, with all kind of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now if these words don't bring you back to where we're at in Hebrews chapter 12, nothing's going to. Because you have been equipped with everything you need to run this battle. You have every spiritual gift. You can't say, God, I can't go do this because I don't have this ability. I don't have this gift. Because God will give it to you if you have the mindset of Christ. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to the mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea. 
This is what you've been equipped with. You are a son of God Almighty. You have heaven's armies at your disposal. Do you believe this? doesn't mean He's going to just do what you say to do and you're going to part the Red Sea like Moses. Moses didn't part the Red Sea. Get it? God parted the Red Sea, but Moses got to be a part of it. But whatever you get to be a part of, if it's the one thing in your life is seeing one estranged person in your relationship, a child, a brother, sister, mother, come to Jesus Christ. That is a miracle from heaven. And if you walk and live and love like Jesus, there's a better chance you're going to see that than not see that. Do you value the salvation that you have? Do you cherish it? Do you love and live because you've been redeemed from this sinful way? Without holiness, you'll never see the Lord. You are holy, but it's up to you to live a holy life because God lives in and through you if you allow Him. So Hebrews chapter 12. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. I'm in verse 14. And to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up causing troubles and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. We have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and it is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits, to, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel. You have come to all of those things that we mention now, not when you get to heaven. You have come as a child who has inherited what his father is offering him. Verse 25, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but, but now he has promised, Once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The word once more indicates the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Future. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, this is what we're fixing our eyes on, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So I ask you then, if this is who we are in Christ Jesus, if this is what we're going to be receiving as children of the Most High, then how are you living today because the spectators are watching you? What are they seeing? Now, I know in most cases what, what they're going to see is they're going to see somebody who professes their faith and who lives good most of the time. I can confidently say that about each one of us. But that doesn't mean we can't do better. Because see, again, when you take it back to a race and take it to Hebrews, what would you say about that runner who runs for a little bit and then, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, there's a happy meal over here. Let me, let me get out of this race for a happy meal, a bowl of red stew. What, whatever it is. You see, when they fall, they get back up and they run harder to make up the ground they lost. Because of an earthly prize? Because of just competing and finishing the race? Many people that run a marathon simply to do it to say they can complete it. They don't ever dream of, of placing or anything. They run it to complete it. And this race, again, that the author tells you about in Hebrews, you're not racing against anybody else. 
You're ra running the race marked out for you, and you're running it to see how much you're going to try to run it on your own or how much you let Jesus run it for you. The whole goal is to be like Christ, something you cannot do on your own, but something Jesus has did on the cross and will continue to do through your life as you read and study God's Word, as you become prayerfully dependent, as you fellowship with one another, as you allow the Spirit to reveal all truth to you and sanctify you through and through. It's Jesus doing it in a rotten sinner like me. So that people say, well, you know what? He used to be this way. Even in his Christian faith, he used to be this way. But I'm watching him grow and mature, something that, that Paul warned the, the church in Corinth about because he said, I, I can't give you anything other than milk. At least they're babies, at least they're born again, at least they're getting milk. But every baby wants to grow up. Every Christian should want to run the waste well and hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Not, hey, why'd you stop over here? And if you quit, did I, was I really in the first place? Did I re Those are things for you to decide. I'm not going to teach theology of, of racers that quit or anything else. My job here is to motivate you to run well, to live an example that you see so that you'll do it yourself. So that's why Paul says, imitate us. We live lives that are not only born by the Spirit, but live by the Spirit of, of, of Christ. So let's start at verse 14 and look at it. Make every effort, that means to pursue or follow after, to run in order to catch your goal. It also means to be persecuted for doing so, depending on how that is translated. Make every effort then, even be persecuted to, run hard to do what? To live in peace. Now, that doesn't mean as much to you, but it means something to the Hebrews. To live in shalom. Perfect peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. That there are no bad things in my life anymore. That I am back into a right relationship with God. My sins have been atoned for. I rest in peace. Nothing can take that away from me. I live at peace with everyone, even that crummy neighbor, even that whatever. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 15, And with your feet fitted, oh, that sounds kind of like a runner, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. If you place track shoes on, you're going to run better than you're going to run in sandals, aren't you? Colossians 3.15, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart so that it motivate you. Since as members of one body, we're running this race together, you were called to peace. Philippians 4.7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding, all human wisdom, everything else will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Jesus said in John 14 verses 25 to 27, I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said. This is your coach along the way. And he's not only your coach along the race, but he also gives you the inner strength to do it. Remind you of everything I said to you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Because you know where Jesus went. He went to prepare a place for you. My Father has many rooms for you. If it were not so, would I have told you this? You can trust Jesus and He's with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He lives inside of you. You are a, a group of royal priests. You are the temple of God. At peace with everyone. That means even your enemies. Then there's a conjunction, and. And to be holy. Sanctified. For without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now this is not implying that some of you are not holy or anything else. The letter is to the Hebrew church. There are wolves in sheep clothing in there, but if you are a sheep, you are holy. 
But there is still the job of growing to maturity. There's still the job of running the race well. That is why sanctification is a one-time event and a process throughout your life to draw you to be more and more and more and more like Christ until you reach that goal. Are you sanctified then? If you are saved, if you are sanctified, you need to pursue peace. That's this direction, right? And you need to pursue holiness. This is this direction. Am I lined up with it? Can you see the cross? Because you've got to have a right relationship with God and you've got to have a right relationship with people. Jesus summed it up when He said what the greatest commandment was in the second greatest commandment. Oh, but I have to hear it every day to get it through my fat head. Because every day I don't want to be wronged. I told you that one earlier. I don't necessarily want to wrong others, but I don't want to be wronged. That's just not right. Oh, well, wait a minute. Jesus going to the cross for me. How wrong can that be in the world's eyes that God would give up His Son's life to save a wretched sinner like me? All I've got to do is believe it, though. And then the Holy Spirit, if I'll allow Him, will transform me through and through and through. See to it, verse 15, it's like a watchman or an overseer or a shepherd. He looks after others even more than himself. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Grace, what I do not deserve, unmerited favor from God, nothing that I can do to obtain it. Something I cannot even describe since it's God's grace. And it is God's will that I fully experience this as His child. In John chapter 1, you read verse 12, Yet to all who did receive Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. I, I, I could stay here all day, I won't, and tell you what I think that means, to get a, just a glimpse of being a child of God, because I don't have a clue. But I, when I get a glimpse of it, I'm God's child. My inheritance is in heaven. My brother is Jesus. He's filled me with His Spirit. I belong to Him. How much I'm loved, how much I'm equipped. All who did believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. What kind of children? Ch children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus wants to give you that grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one that I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given. Your translation may say grace upon grace upon grace. That is God's will for you that in any circumstance, any condition, you receive his grace. So you can walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So that you can face anything that besets you. So that you are equipped for any battle that you might be fighting. So that any tragedy, any pain in your life, He can bring you comfort so that you can comfort others. You're going to read that in 2 Corinthians. So verse 15 of Hebrews 12 says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and, there's an and again, that no bitter root grows up. Well, what's a bitter root? Well, first of all, it's something that tastes bad. Right? It's bitter, sour. It causes trouble. It gives stomach pains. It defiles even, is, is what it goes on to say. It says it, if it grows up, it causes trouble and defiles many. Then why would we want bitterness in the body, let alone bitterness out in the world? Because... If they are going to see our love, that's what they're going to, how we're, they're going to know we're Christians. What is the opposite of that? The bitterness that we have towards others? Especially some of those on that list, like the 
sexually immoral and the drunkard. Oh, I can very easily be bitter towards them, but why would I want to be? Instead, I want to love them as Jesus loved. That doesn't mean you don't tell them about their sins when you're given the opportunity, but it doesn't mean you point fingers at them either in your righteous condemnation. Verse 16, See to it that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. So now we have our example. There is no way I'm like Esau. Really? Okay. Yeah, Esau married to, to pagan wives. He didn't consider his birthright there. He even sold his birthright for a Happy Meal, for a bowl of stew, red stew. But there's so much more that this is telling you, and the Hebrews would be familiar with this. Like I said, going into this, he gave up his birthright. He was the firstborn son. That means everything to the nation of Israel. It doesn't mean as much to us. We love our children the same and everything. The firstborn son carries on the name of the family. It's in Jesus' lineage, but Esau is not there because he traded it for a bowl of stew. The things of the world, that's why he married into the world in the first place. He knew that he shouldn't marry women from pagan lands, but he married them anyway because they enticed him. Just like Lot set his eyes to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened? He lost his wife, didn't he? What if he set an example and, and, and pitched his tents towards heaven? Would his wife follow him? I don't know. I have no idea. But I know that he longed for the world... I know that Esau longed for the world, and here's what's happened. He traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. How could anyone be that dumb? How could be anyone be that godless and commit that kind of harlotry with God? I'm a child of God. I should, subst subst I should sustain, I was trying to get sustain and sustain mixed up, I'm sorry, from any appearance of evil. My words should only be words that edify, not cut down and destroy. Okay, now some of you can agree with me, you're guilty. <laughs> there are none righteous, no, not one. And the wages, what we've earned, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you believe that as a child of God? So when I say to myself, I can't do this anymore, I'm not equipped to anything else, I fall on my knees, and He equips me more if I ask Him. What kind of earthly father would not give good gifts to his son, Jesus said? How much more... Do you think that the, that the God in heaven, our, your heavenly Father, will give you the Holy Spirit when you pray and ask Him? Especially when you go in and pray and say, Lord, give me my testimony so that I can be a light to others. Lord, help me to face my indifference so that I can love someone else. Help me in my time of need, even because I want to give to this person who has a time of need and I might have to do without, but I will, I'll be happy with daily bread. That's how that we should be praying as Christians. See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. I hope that I've painted that where you understand that a little more. He, what did he sell? He sold his inheritance rights. What were his inheritance rights? The eldest son's rights, not just a child. But the eldest son, the one who got half of everything the father had, and then the other sons got split the rest of the half. He's trying to paint a picture here that as God's child, don't sell yourself short. You are God's child. Each and every one of you. You belong to the kingdom of heaven, not to the kingdom of this earth. You belong to King Jesus, not to Satan. Verse 17, afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, <laughs> wait a minute, what have I done? He was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he'd done. Now don't get sidetracked here. The point is not whether Esau sought it with tears or not. The, the 
the point here is what had been done could not be undone. Isaac couldn't give the blessing again. Jacob got it. He is in the lineage of Christ. His name is, was changed to Israel. Wow, wait a minute. All these things did happen to Jacob, didn't they? And they should have happened to Esau. But he traded his inheritance. Now do you see how, how big this is? Trading this for a meal? And there's been plenty of times when I've said, I said, oh, I'm so hungry, I could, or whatever. That's literally what he said. It was foolish. It was, it was rash. But it shows his heart that he didn't consider the heritage that he had of being a child of Israel, not Israel at that point, but of, of Father Abraham, as something to be valued. He sought after the world more. So it's not that I don't value my salvation, it's how much am I still seeking after other things. Because I can say I value my salvation all day long, but this will show it. How holy I am, and how much I love and do for others. Verse 18 then. You have come to a mountain that cannot... That, uh, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. So we're going all the way back to Moses and the giving of the law. The law which we can't abide by. The law that does not save anyone. The law that shows us that we are unholy, shows us, as Paul says, how much a wretch I am. And that mountain burned with fire. It couldn't be touched. It was dark, gloom, and storm. There was a, stor a trumpet blast, verse 19. To, of, and a voice speaking, and the people who heard it begged that no further words be even spoken to them. This will be familiar again to the Hebrews. It's not as familiar to us, unfortunately. The mountain shook, the earth trembled, people were afraid of the voice, the mediator was Moses, who himself says here, I trembled in fear. There is a new mediator of a better covenant. His name is Jesus. You know it again. The people in chapter 11 didn't know it. You know it. It's Jesus. And He will come. There will be a trumpet blast and He will call His children, His brothers and sisters, to be with Him forever. Should that not motivate you? The sight was so terrified... Well, I skipped this part. Verse 20, because they could not bear what was commanded, even an animal touches the mountains, it must be stoned to death. An innocent animal. Because there's coming a day when all of heaven and earth will be destroyed. God will purge it and we'll start over. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Verse 22, but, a beautiful but here. The total opposite. You have come now. In the present, because you are God's child now, living in a foreign world here on earth, living as an alien, hopefully living as Jesus Christ. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, firstborn, get that, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, made complete. Just like in chapter 11, we saw that our job is to walk like the ancient heroes and heroines of old, to become complete, perfect. To Jesus, that's why we fix our eyes on Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you understand what it means to be a child of God? And not only a child of God but you're literally inheriting firstborn rights. Don't give them up. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the son, of the, Im the son of the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is talking about the supremacy of Christ. Paul's writing this letter to the Colossians saying to them why Christ is so much better than the world. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through Him and for Him. 
He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. Get that? He's either your head that guides you, or He is not. He is the beginning, you could say the author and the perfecter, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have supremacy. <clears throat> For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now He has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in His sight, without blemish and free from accusation." If you continue in your faith established and firm. Sounds like the way we started out the letter in Hebrews, doesn't it? And do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that was proclaimed to every creature under heaven in which I, Paul, have become a servant. And you read in Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, God chose, chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through believing the truth, this process of the Spirit sanctifying you and the faith that you have. He called you, to, called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings He passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. From Galatians, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. The author of Hebrews has given us this pattern. He's done so much pr presentation here of why Christ is better and what this new covenant means and the saints and, or heroes and heroines of old. And then in verse 12, he says, Therefore, set your eyes on Jesus. Strip off everything. You're in a race. Get rid of anything else because it doesn't matter so you can run this race well. You're running it together. And now he's put us to, you've got to live a life that shows this. You don't want to be godless or a harlot to the Lord God. How are you living your life? Are you running this race? Be careful. Many are falling back because of persecutions. And in this case, they're falling back just because of worldliness. Maybe they needed persecution. <laughs> Maybe they needed persecution to, to, to test their faith, to give them perseverance, to give them strength. Is that what we need as a church in America? Do we take the opportunity that we have now and the freedom that we have now to do things? The American dream has become that I can do whatever I want to do. Not that I can love the Lord my God without persecution. Verse 25 of Hebrews 12, See to it that you do not refuse Him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused Him who warned them on earth... How much less will we if we turn away from Him who warns us from heaven? At that time, back at Mount Sinai, His voice shook the earth. Even innocent animals died. But now He has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Anything that is defiled will be destroyed. The words once more indicates the removal of all... Uh, removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. A child of God. A child of God cannot be shaken. And if you cannot be shaken when destruction comes to the heavens and the earth, why are you shaken today? Why do things bother you? Why do you say, poor, poor, pitiful me? Why do you say, I can't do what you're asking me to do, God? For the glory set before Him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, its ridicule. Verse 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. 
for our God is a consuming fire. Now, I read some commentaries on this and stuff, and there was a lot of commentaries about how a fire uh, purifies and everything, but that is not the way it's used in the text here. There is plenty of places it's used that way, but it here is our God consumes that which can be consumed, everything created that is not redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and the new covenant, everything that is not a child of God. So are you a child of God? Are you living that life, holy, set apart, sanctified? Are you living for one another? You know, it's sad when the, the religious leader came up to Jesus that day and tried to justify how he was living and said, well, who is my neighbor? Again, you've got to know some of the background. The neighbor was the rotten, stinking, half-breed Samaritan, the one that did not know the truth, the one that didn't have the inheritance right as, the, as a child of Israel, a child of the kingdom of God, the fo- child of the father uh, of faith of Abraham, because he didn't really have the faith of Abraham. The priest passed by, the Levite passed by, and didn't do. They might have thought they had this relationship right, but this wasn't rela- relationship right, wasn't right. So it was the rotten, stinking Samaritan that showed someone else how to love. I don't know about you, but I have had several times in my life, many times in my life, where someone who does not proclaim to be a Christian showed me what it was like to live more like a Christian than how I was living. Because I had jealousy, animosity, covetousness in my heart, pride. And I saw them go unconditionally love. It's what I saw as a spectator. I knew that they didn't proclaim to be a Christian, but they did proclaim love. They did proclaim compassion. And it humbles me each and every time I see that, and I'm sure I'll probably see it again in my life. I need to die to myself so that the Spirit can live through me. Because I'm a child of God. I am running a race. He has called me to run it well. I can't slack off, even though I want to, and I will if I don't let the Spirit fill me, because it has eternal consequences, and especially eternal consequences to my children and their children. No one in Esau's lineage became a child of God. In fact, you don't hear of the Edomites anymore. The children children of Israel, (laughs) there's a nation again called Israel. (laughs) Wow, God is in complete sovereign control. But Esau's lineage continued to fight with the children of Israel and you don't even read about them in history anymore. The red people, the Edomites, because their father way back when that should have valued his inheritance as the firstborn sold it out for a bowl of red stew. Our God is a consuming fire. It starts with the word for, which is a prepositional phrase tying it all together. There will come a day, it will come like a thief in the night. The world will be going on around just like normal in the days of Noah. But for the people who aren't right with God, who aren't children of God, it will come as a terrible, terrible day. It will come as hope and blessing for those who are earnestly seeking after Jesus. Let the Spirit fill you. Run this race with everything God has equipped you with. Not everything that you have, but what God has equipped you with as His child. And then you've got to go to Hebrews chapter 13 and read the first verse. Read it continuous because this is a continuous letter. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Paul saw that they were doing some of this. That they were loving one another. And he says, keep on loving, because that's how you'll be known. You'll be known as Christians by your love for one another. Joy, you picked out that song because it was a closing song. That's how Sherry knew the number. (laughs) Because they will know we are Christians by our love. Or they won't. It's up to you whether we sing it again or you pick a different one. But I'm going to close in prayer.
Lord, may we live a life empowered by the Spirit so that spectators see Christ in us. May we not only love you for the fact that we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, but may we grow in our sanctification through and through, and that it may be seen by the way that we love one another. Father, forgive us our sins. Forgive us for when we don't love. Forgive us for taking our birthright and our salvation for granted, Lord. You are an awesome, loving, compassionate God who has given us more than we can ever, ever imagine. Lord, teach us through your spirits to understand how wide, how deep your love is. How much the blessings that you have for us now and forevermore because we are your children. And may we live and love like Jesus in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.